New beginning. We don't see Mac for two days. When he returns, he doesn't talk about Stella. Mac says he's anxious to teach Ruby some tricks. He says the billboard is bringing more visitors. He says it's time for a new beginning. All afternoon and into the evening, Max work, works with Ruby. Ruby's feet are looped with rope so that she cannot run. A heavy shank hangs off her neck. Max shows her, her Stella's ball, her pedestal, her stool. He introduces her to sneakers. When Ruby obeys Max, obeys Mac, he gives her a cube of sugar or a bit of dried apple. When she doesn't, he yells and kicks at the, kicks at the sawdust. When George and Julia arrive, Mac is still training Ruby. Julia sits on a bench and watches them. She draws a little, but mostly she keeps her eyes on Ruby. Bob watches too. He's hiding in the corner of my domain under not tag. It's, train, it's raining outside, and Bob does not like damp feet. Ruby trudges behind Mac, her head dropping. Endlessly, they circle the ring. Sometimes, Mac slaps her flank with his hand. Suddenly, Ruby jerks to a stop. Mac pulls the chain hard, but Ruby refuses to move. Come on, Ruby. Mac is almost pleading. What is your problem? She's exhausted, I say to myself. That's the problem. Mac groans. Idiot elephant. Idiot human, Bob mutters. Walk, Ruby, I say, although I know she's too far away. To hear me, do what he says. Walk, Mac commands. Now, Ruby doesn't walk. She plops her rump on the sawdust floor. I think maybe she's tired, Julia says. Mac wipes his forehead with the back of his arm. Yeah, I know. We're all tired. He pushes Ruby with the heel of his foot. She ignores him. George looks over from the food court where he's wiping off tables. Mac, he yells. Maybe you should call it a day. I'll close up. Mac yams on Ruby's chain. She's an anchor as a tree trunk. She pulls harder and falls to his. He pulls harder, and falls to his knees. That does it, Max says. He brushes sawdust off his jeans. I'm through playing around. Max stomps off to his office. When he returns, he's carrying a long stick. The gleaming hook on his end is almost beautiful, like a sil, like a sliver of moon. It's a claw stick. Mac pucks Ruby with a sharp point. No harm, just a touch. I can tell he wants her to see how much it can hurt. I grow, I grow low in my throat. Ruby doesn't budge. She's a gray, unmoving boulder. She closes her eyes, and for a moment, I wonder if she might have fallen asleep. A warning you, Mac says. He breathes out. He stares at the ceiling. Ruby makes a huffing sound. Fine, Max says. You want to play it that way. He draws back to the claw stick. No, Julia cries. I'm not gonna hurt her, Max says. I just want to get her attention, Bob snarls. Max swings. The hooks slices there just a few inches above Ruby's head. See? Why do you, why you don't want to mess with me? Max says. He draws back the claw stick again. Now move. Ruby jerks her head, flipping her trunk towards Mac. She makes a noise that sends the sawdust scattering. It makes my glass shiver. It is the most beautiful mat I have ever heard. Ruby's trunk slaps into Mac. I don't see exactly where she strikes him. Somewhere below his stomach, I think. And I know he must be uncomfortable because Mac drops the claw stick and falls down onto the ground and curls into a ball and howls like a baby. 
their direct hit, Bob says. Poor Mac. Mac groans. He stumbles to his feet and hobbles off towards the office, to his office. Ruby watches him leave. I can't read his, her expression. Is she afraid, relieved, proud? When Mac is gone, George and Julia lead Ruby from the ring. It's okay, baby. It's okay, Julia says, stuck in Ruby's head. They settle Ruby in her domain and make sure she has fresh water and food before long Ruby's losing. Dad, Julia asks as George locks Ruby iron door. Do you think Mac will ever hurt Ruby? I don't think so, Jules, George says. At least I hope not. Maybe we could call someone. George scratches his chin. I wish I could help Ruby, but I wouldn't know how. I mean, who would I call? The elephant cops? Besides, George looks down. I need this job, Jules. We need this job. Your mom, the doctor bills. He kisses the top of Julia's head. Back to work, you and me both. Julia sighs and reaches for her backpack. She moves a piece of paper, a bottle of water, and a small metal box. Homework first, George says, wagging a finger. Then you can paint. It is for our class, Julia explains. We're doing watercolors. I'm going to paint Ruby. George smiles. All right, then. Just don't forget your spelling. Dad, Julia asks again. Do you see Max's face when Ruby hit him? George nods. Yes, he says sullenly. I did. He shakes his head. He said, "Poor Mac." He turns away, and only then do I hear him laughing. Colors. Julia opens the metal box. I see a row of little squares: green, blue, red, black, yellow, purple, orange. The colors seem to glow. She pulls out a brush with a thin tuft of a tail at its end. She dips the brush in water and wets the paper. Then taps at the red square. When the brush meets the damp paper, pink petals of color unfold like morning flowers. I can't take my eyes off of the magical brush. For a moment, I'm not thinking about Ruby and Mac and the caustic and Stella. Almost. Julia touches red again, then blue, and there suddenly is the purple of a ripe grape. She touches the blue, and her paper turns to summer sky, black and white, and now I see that she's painting a picture of Ruby. I can make out her fluffy ears, her thick legs. Julia stops painting. She takes a few steps back, hands on her hips, gazing at her work. She calls. It's not right, she says. She glances over her shoulder at me. I try to look encouraging. She starts to crumple up the paper, then reconsiders. Instead, she slides it into my cage at the spot where my glass is broken. Here you go, she says. A Julia original. That'll be worth millions someday. Fingerly, I pick up the paper. I do not eat a single bite of it. Oh, hey, I almost forgot. Julia runs to her backpack. She pulls out three plastic jars, one yellow, one blue, one red. She opens the jars, and an odd nut wood smell hits my nose. Julia pushes the jars one by one through the opening. Then she slides some paper through. These are called finger paints, she says. My aunt gave them to me, but really, I'm too old for finger painting. I Take a finger into the red yard. The paint is thick as mud. It's cool and smooth, like bananas on the flip. I pop my finger into my mouth. It's not exactly ripe mango, but it's not bad. Julia laughs. You don't eat it, you paint with it. She grabs a piece of paper and presses her fingers on it. See, like this. I place my finger on a piece of paper. I lift it, and a red mark is there. I get a bigger glob from the pot and slap my hand down on the paper. When I pull my hand off the paper, it is is red twin stays behind. This isn't like the ghostly half prints of my glass. 
the ones my best was left behind. This handprint can be so easily wiped away. A bad dream. I lay awake, feeling the dry red paint off my fingers. Bob, who accidentally walked on one of my paintings, is licking his red paws. Every so often, I glance over the empty room, the claustic gleams in the moonlight. Stop! No! Ruby's frantic cries startle me. Ruby, I call. You're having a bad dream. You're okay. You're safe. Where's Stella? She asks, gulping air. Before I can answer, she says, never mind, I remember now. Go back to sleep, Ruby, I say. You have had a hard day. I can't go back to sleep, she says. I'm afraid I'll have the same dream. There was a sharp stick and it hurt. I look at Bob and he looks back at me. Oh, Ruby says, oh, Mac. She puts her trunk between the bars. Do you think, she hesitates, do you think Mac is mad because I hurt him today? I consider lying, but gorillas are terrible liars. Probably, I finally say. He ran away after that, Ruby says. Bob gives us scornful laugh. Corolla weighs more like it. We are quiet for a while. Branch, branches claw at the roof. A light rain drums. One of the parrots murmurs something in her sleep. Ruby breaks the silence. Ivan, I smell something funny. I can't help it, Bob says. I believe she's referring to the finger paints Julia gave me, I said. What are finger paints, Ruby asks. You can make pictures with them, I explain. Could you make a picture of me? Someday, maybe someday, I remember Julia's picture, the one that will be worth a million dollars. I hold it up to the glass. Look, it's you. Julia made it. It's hard to see, Ruby says. There's not much moonlight. Why do I have two trucks? I examine the picture. Those are feet. Why do I have two feet? That's called a artistic license, Bob says. Ruby says, could you tell me another story? She asks. I don't think I can ever go back to sleep. I told you all I remember, I said with helpless shrug. Then tell me a new story, she says. Make something up. I try to think, but my thoughts keep turning, keep returning to Mac and his claustic. Anything yet? Ruby says. I'm working on it. Ivan, Ruby presses. Bob said you are going to save me. I I search for two words. I'm working on that too. Ivan, Ruby says in a voice so low I can barely hear her. I have another question. I can tell from the sound of her voice that this will be a question I don't want to answer. Ruby taps her trunk against the rusty iron bars of her door. Do you think, she asks, that I'll die in this domain someday like Aunt Stella? Once again, I consider lying. But when I look at Ruby, the half four words die in my throat. No, if I can help it, I say instead. I feel something tighten in my chest, something dark and hot, and it's not a domain. I add, I pause, and then I say it. It's a cage. 